Hi everyone, welcome. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to um, uh, to listen to this discussion, and I'm very very excited to to talk to you about uh, communication of data in crisis mode. And this presentation is really going to focus on on risk communication and and how can we as scientists uh, think about uh, how can we efficiently communicate with people who are not scientists, maybe part of the general public uh, um, or lay audiences, if you will. And the big question is, of course, like, why, why am I talking to you this and, and, uh, and, and how do we get there and how, how is this relevant? And just let me, let me very quickly share a little bit of myself. Uh, my name is Imre Bardiu and um, my background is in medical science. So I'm for 10 years, um, I was, I was in, I was in labs. I, 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 I basically spent every single day of uh, my, um, of those 10 years in, in a lab. You now I did the experiments, killed a lot of mice uh, as one would. My research area was actually cardiovascular medicine. But after a time, what really, really got me interested is, okay, this is awesome. To, it's awesome to generate science and it's awesome to generate scientific information and data. But what really got me going is how do we communicate that and how do we make a great story out of that data? And how can we present it in a meaningful way so that people can understand it who are not scientists? And there's many ways uh, that, that we do that. Uh, the University Research uh, Center, you know, I used to teach um, uh, students, uh, medical students for, uh, for over 10 years. Um, and it was that joy uh, that I felt while I was teaching that I really felt like I really need to go deeper and explore this idea of communicating science to multiple audiences. So I really turned into this field of science communication. And within that, because of my expertise in, in cardiovascular medicine, I turned more specifically to health communication. Um, so after my Fulbright scholarship at Harvard, I transitioned to um, Master of Public Health program at Columbia University. And I, I, I obtained a degree in health communication and um, I got a cert certificate and I'm certified as a health education specialist yeah, in the US, which, uh, which is really me uh, getting into this whole new field of uh, of communication and, and and my expertise really lies at that intersection of science and communication right now. Um, this pathway led me to uh, a health communications agency in Manhattan. So I work for UZ Yellow as a VP director of behavioral learning strategy. And at the same time, I'm also a senior lecturer at Semmelweis University, which is a medical school back in Hungary. I'm super excited um, to bring some thoughts to you around how to expand into the non-scientific world uh, using our data and using the science, but making it really actionable and applicable to uh, large audiences. So as a part of that, we're gonna be focusing on scientifically based risk and how we communicate that risk to large audiences. Um, so this is where, where we start the conversation. And this intro is really meant to show why it is important for scientists to be able to communicate with the public and to communicate with the public efficiently. And one of the reasons is that the threats that uh, we as humanity face together, like it or not, really, really require cooperation on a societal level. Uh, but that cooperation cannot be effective without a very strong scientific grounding, so to say. And that's when your work comes in. You have the science, you're closest to the scientific findings, you're closest to how research is done, how research is done well, and how facts and data are generated. But in order for the whole society to act on these facts, we need a cooperation and we need to make that happen. And it has to start with your work and your work has to expand into, uh, into more of a societal context. So what you see here in the middle is We've just, we're just experiencing the first wave of these three waves that this uh, graph depicts. Uh, we're, uh, we're on some side of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, some argue that we're, uh, we're over the worst part of it. Some argue that the worst is uh, just, just to come. Um, we're still living with it. And we've seen in the last two to three years uh, how public facing communication about the science of COVID-19 uh, has had some pitfalls had some had some challenges and, um, and and all sorts of ups and downs. So I think that really demonstrated um, the importance of of science communication in general. And the bad news is that no matter whether we think COVID nineteen has ended or not, there are other threats ahead of us. 
that need um, more societal cooperation. And so whether we're talking about climate change uh, or whether we're talking about the next pandemic, uh, whether we're talking about monkeypox, whether we're talking about anything else that may come out, come in our way without being specific, we need to think about uh, how we communicate clearly with uh, with the public and with patients and, and with and with people who are not who might not be experts. The next thing that that is really just just gives us a high level context for this is, of course, there's lots of scientific knowledge out there, and you are where your work is part of generating that huge amount of scientific uh, progress and scientific data, but. There is a huge gap between what scientists have gathered and what the public actually understands. And this gap needs to be filled in order for that, that big societal cooperation um, to, to work well. And this gap cannot be filled with, with just one approach. This gap has to be filled from, has to be, has to be kind of uh, filled with a bridge that is being built from both sides. And from the public side, there's no question that we need better education, we need better science education, uh, and we need better information for the people to be able to act upon and to be able to increase their scientific skills. It's not that we want everyone to become a scientist, but we really, really need to increase people's scientific uh, literacy. On the other side, uh, we scientists need to become a little bit better in terms of what we're, uh, in terms of what we're communicating and how we're communicating our findings. And then the last piece of this uh, that complicates the picture today is, of course, the rise of misinformation. And many of you will have heard that misinformation is nothing new to humanity. It has always been around uh, in certain shapes and forms. But nowadays, because of the rise of social media and the tremendous amount of social media platforms that can, uh, that can spread misinformation very, 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 in a very rapid fashion, we need to deal with this, and this is something that will interfere with our messaging as scientists. So we'll talk about all these factors, but let's let's begin with some very, very, very basic um, concepts. Because why are we even thinking about communicating risk, and what does this really mean to communicate risk in an efficient way? And in order to understand that, we have a couple of behavioral science frameworks, which uh, which I. I, I would like to go through very, very quickly in a very, very high level fashion. So understanding the risk is key to action. We know from behavioral science frameworks that if people don't understand the real threat they're being faced with, they're not gonna act on said threat. And that seems very, very simple, but there's a lot that goes into that. And if you take a look at this graph, which really shows uh, what we call the health belief model, which is a very one of one of the simplest behavioral models that deal with uh, more specifically how people take action on health associated risks such as a pandemic such as the threat of an, an an infection there are two sides of the story there's one side where people will think about what is the risk what is really the risk that i'm facing and the rudimentary the most rudimentary understanding of that risk has two components one centers around severity Let's say we're talking about an infection. If I get this infection, how severe is it going to be? How bad is it going to be for me to get it? Is it deadly? Is it lethal? Am I going to get in a hospital? If so, how bad is it going to be? Or am I just going to uh, am I just going to sit in my home for three days and drink tea? Those are very very different levels of severity. The second component of that, you'll see in the left, is susceptibility. A very important question. Am I susceptible to this disease? Can I get it? Am I, am I one of those people, so to say, in plain language, who will likely get this disease? Or am I more protected from this, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and, and can lead to, to much misunderstanding. So this is something that needs to be very much clarified in our, in our messaging. But so the, these two components together form this idea of a perceived risk. On the other hand, there's, um, there's the perceived net value of action. As people are looking into solutions and people are, are thinking about their behavior and there's a solution offered in order, to, for, in order for them to take and act upon. So let's say it's, it can be a medication, it can be vaccination to, re to prevent an infection. They will think about the value of that action first. What is the benefit of that action to me? 
and they will also think about the costs. And when we think about costs, it can be many things, not just monetary, right? What are some cognitive barriers in the way? Uh, am I afraid of needles? Um, is that something that will that will eventually factor into the equation um, in a way that will impede my action? So there's two sides of this story again: R assessing the risk the right way, and then assessing the behavior that is presented to me to defend me from the risk. Now the other behavioral model that takes this one step further, and and then we'll we'll stop getting into uh, into behavioral science, I promise. But uh, but this this paints a little bit more nuanced picture. Uh, in terms of how this risk assessment could work during a state of emergency, during a, during a situation of emergency, such as a pandemic outbreak. So what people are faced with um, in these situations is there's there's a health message coming in. That health message is usually coming, coming through a public health professional or, or a public health authority. Of course, that message origin, originated in some sort of scientific platform in a lab. Someone has found something, someone has identified something that data accumulated, the public health authorities took it over, and now they're communicating to the public. And that uh, message usually contains, here's the threat, and here's, um, and here's what you need to do about that threat. And this model, which is called the extended parallel processing model, actually talks about two steps of assessing the situation. And it says that if either of these steps, people feel like they're um, they're, they're not gonna take, or they're not gonna wanna take, then the whole process stops. So in step one, they're gonna be assessing the threat, right? But just similarly to what we talked about in the previous um, in the previous slide, they're gonna be thinking about, am I susceptible? And, and, is this, and, and is this severe enough? Is the disease severe enough so that, I, so that I should deal with it? If the answer is no, they're not gonna move forward in the thought process. No matter how well we craft our messaging around why vaccinations are important, why you should take this medication, why this is a really good form of prevention. If people feel like the risk is not worth dealing with, they're gonna stop right away. And this process is not gonna move forward to the, to the next phase of this risk assessment. In this, in this model, which is the extended parallel process model, the next step, once people feel like, yes, this is a risk that I understand and that I need to think about, and it's serious enough that I think about it, the next message processing around, basically, is around what is the efficacy of the solution that I'm presented, right? And when it comes to efficacy, there are two parts of this. What's the response efficacy? If you're presenting me with a vaccine, how efficacious is that vaccine, right? That was a question, that's a question that we've been hearing for, for, for over, over two years now. It's a very important aspect of, of assessing uh, assessing the solution presented. And the second part of this conversation is what is my efficacy? What is that? What does that mean to be to, for, for me to have an efficacy? It means that you know, in order for me to carry out the behavior, I need to be self-efficacious. Is this something that I can do myself? Am I able to get that medication, get that, get access to that um, that injection? Am I Am I able to do it? Am I able to carry out this, um, this behavior that is being presented to me as a solution? If the answer is no to any of those, any of those questions, then according to this model, people are not going to move forward in the message processing. They will just deny the existence of this message and they will not act upon the message. So these are a couple of things to think about when we're communicating any sort of risk and, and any sort of scientific data and for perhaps solutions to what, what the data implies. Now, diving a little bit deeper into, um, into people's understanding of risk, how good do we think people are really at understanding uh, science at all in general? So let's go back there. And well, the answer is uh, generally people are not very good. Uh, if we take a look at the US, we have some survey data that show us that about around 70% of the US can't read and understand the science of New York Times, uh, the science section of New York Times, um, which is not the, the deepest level of science, um, but, um, but just think about that for a second. Uh, it means two thirds of the population is not gonna be fully able to understand what that science section means. That tells us a little bit about generally um, what, what the problem that we're facing. Now, one third of the population is considered uh, scientifically illiterate. 
right? So that, that means they're even, they have even lower levels of scientific understanding. Now, how they measure these, like there's ways to measure this. And of course there's questionnaires and, and th it, this cannot be perfect because there's so much, there's so many different forms of science out there, right? So how can you really measure what a person's scientific literacy is? So these are valid questions, but nevertheless, uh, there, there, there are multiple surveys that show that these these percentages seem to be seem to be correct so this doesn't put us in a really really good position when we need to communicate about scientific data and actually what uh what what the data shows and what if you if you just take a look around on the internet uh, well you'll see that most of the data presented to people who are looking for scientific information is actually way above their average understanding so this is this is a study that was uh, that was specifically looking into COVID nineteen related website content, and very simply, what the authors did in two thousand twenty March is took a couple of search words COVID nineteen SARS CoV and so on and so on. Looked at the first thirty uh, uh, pages that Google served up because they figured that people won't even be looking uh, after the first uh, 30, 30 finds or hits on Google, and they just looked at the reading level of these websites. And um, you'll see on the right here that there is a pink line which shows the average reading level of the US population, which is which might be shocking, but it's around the seventh grade reading level, right? Um, and of course, this, this differs for certain populations and it differs with the socioeconomic status, with education status. But if you want to take a look at the average, it's around the seventh level, seventh grade level everything that they found for COVID was above this, right? Most of the hospital materials and most of the, even the governmental um, healthcare uh, websites were higher reading level, around 12th, 15th, and so on and so on. So there's quite a big, a big a bit of a gap that uh, people are facing when they're looking for science information. So they have, they have generally not so great science literacy. They're faced with materials that are generally um, too high, for them to, uh, to, to comprehend or too high level for them to comprehend. What happens, what happens then if we actually start uh, increasing people's scientific literacy level? So let's, let's play around for this thought for a second. Let's say that we educate people and people get educated on scientific facts, their science literacy level starts increasing. Well, this team's prediction was that if there's if someone's science uh, science literacy level increases, if there's a if 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 there's like a ranking where where we say you know on one axis of the curve there's science literacy the ability to understand science and on the y axis there's um, there's the perceived risk of of climate change as a threat right which is a which is a consensus fact in the in the, in the climate change science world. The, this group was predicting that with increased science literacy, the perceived threat, the, the perceived risk uh, that 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 the people will feel that the climate change presents will increase because they will understand the science better and they will understand how much of a threat it really presents. Now, in terms of what they found in the face of this hypothesis was the opposite. Um, so I'll just pause there because um, it's shocking, but it's uh, it's actually not totally unexplainable, right? Uh, what this tells us is that just because someone has a higher level of science literacy, someone's more educated, someone has more background um, in terms of science in general, doesn't necessarily mean that they are, their perceptions of a certain risk is going to align with the perceptions of the scientists, right? Because there are many, many other factors that play into, um, into the equation when people are assessing risk. Their scientific understanding is just one component of that. And there's a myriad of other factors that play into actually viewing and actually assessing scientific risk, belonging to certain groups, whether that, that could be political, that could be non-political groups, and, 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 just, and, and just generally, uh, other emotional factors that are socioeconomical factors that go into that decision and go into that risk appraisal process. So the results are pretty daunting, but what this really tells us is there's something, there's something beyond just the scientific understanding of a certain risk that we need to take into consideration when we're communicating with, uh, with people. And 
the next slide really shows you this expanded understanding of what we call risk. Because I think as scientists, when we start thinking about risk, a lot of times what we what we start envisioning is this measurable risk magnitude times probability kind of equation where we measure how really in plain words, how bad is the risk and what is the probability of a certain person getting at risk. We multiply that and we have a concrete number that really tells us the actual risk of, of, of a certain uh, occurrence. And this could be a risk of catching uh, catching a new disease. This uh, this could this could be a risk of hospitalization if one gets gets infected with uh, uh, with a certain uh, infectious agent. So um, what really the previous findings uh, tell us is that there has to be something else out there in people's minds that goes on and that modifies this equation. So actually, Peter Senman, who's uh, who's one of the lead leading risk communicators um, that in the U.S formulated this uh, this formula, which really talks about two components of the risk uh, assessment. One is about what it calls hazard, which is our typical understanding of what a measurable, a scientifically measurable risk is. But then there's a second part of the risk perception, which we call outrage. And this outrage is the people component of, of the risk. This is actually the public's reaction and people's own reaction to what that risk is. And if you look at this, this is an absolutely mathematically um, incomplete and mathematically uh, might seem incorrect. What this really tells you is that hazard itself and just the scientific understanding of risk is not taking you far if you wanna think about uh, how people perceive risk. Actually, if you take a look at um, at different you know, different factors, different occurrences, different uh, different environmental threats um, that surround us, and ask scientists to um, to to put them in order in terms of what they're worried about the most versus versus the least, and they rank order these threats, and you ask the same from the general public and uh, a good sample of uh, of, of people. The correlation between those two rankings will be very, 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 very low. It will be around 0.2. So this really tells us that the public is generally worried about uh, different things that scientists are worried about. So uh, is this surprising? Probably not so much, because there's a lot that is going on into this outrage component here. And this is really without uh, without trying to be complete here and without trying to paint a complete picture. There are a couple of things that are a couple of characteristics of a certain risk that will determine how big the actual outrage will be. Even if the scientific risk, so to say, the measurable risk is very low, there are certain factors that will influence the risk perception of, uh, of people. And a couple of things on the, um, on the left versus right, if you look at this, coerced versus voluntary risk. Coerced risks will always feel more painful. People will always be more outraged by coerced risk than voluntary risks. What's a coerced risk, right? Like a very, very recent example is, um, is and, and we can talk about whether the risk, the risk perception here is valid or not, but a very, very recent example is, um, is you know, when, when certain um, employers requested uh, vaccination for the employees, right? Now, even though uh, we understand that vaccines are generally, generally super safe, um, in the COVID-19 space and, and other spaces, you know, people who think about that threat, uh, you know, as as non-zero, and now they're coerced, so to say, in a way to take that risk versus the general public who you know who are offered the vaccine but they, they were never forced to take the vaccine. Now these those people who re react to the risk in a very very different manner, right? So the coerced nature of the risk is important. The second here, which is also a good example, and we can tie it back to COVID-19, is, is the risk industrial or is the risk a natural risk? People will always be more outraged by an oil, well, let's say an, an oil spill in the river, which is which can be traced back to a specific factory, so to say, uh, versus a natural risk that occurs um, you know, outside of our control and outside of a company's control. So how does this relate back to COVID-19? You remember the discussion at the beginning um, of the pandemic, whether this came from a lab, whether COVID-19 came from a lab, or it originated 
uh, somehow in nature. Like that, that perception really, really modifies how outraged people are and how they perceive the risk. Then there are a couple of other factors here, unfamiliar versus familiar risk, obviously risks that are more exotic that, that, uh, that people have not encountered before. They, uh, they, they, there, there is a higher likelihood that outrage will, uh, will occur in that situation. Is the risk dreaded or not dreaded? It's a very interesting phrasing again, comes from Peter Sandman's work. But, uh, if we think about Ebola, for instance, where the symptoms are really, really terrifying and, 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 and people have internal bleedings and they die within, uh, within a day. Um, and, and so that picture, that picture is just, uh, it's just much more terrifying for, for a lot of people than for instance, catching a cold, right? So, uh, even if the risk of catching something might be very similar in terms of like likelihood, if the risk itself is more dreaded, uh, that will cause more outrage. And then what is really interesting here um, is the catastrophic versus the chronic nature of risks, uh, which is which is something that that I think we all feel. People are generally um, are generally more afraid of catastrophe and afraid of things that have low likelihood, but they're more catastrophic and they're more dramatic when they happen. Think about a plane crashing. Plane crashing has much, 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 much um, less of a probability than a train crashing or than a car crashing, right? Car crashes happen every day. Car crashes happen every, every single day, every single month throughout the year. Plane crashes uh, do not happen throughout the year. They happen at very, 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 very well specified points in time. And then, and then people really focus on that and really feel like it's, it is a catastrophe because it is a catastrophe. It's just, if you calculate the number and you calculate the actual risk that you're exposed to with a plane ride, it's still going to be much lower than, than what you're exposed to, um, during a car, during a car ride. So these are factors to take into consideration as we're, as we're thinking about how to talk, how we talk about risk. And there are a couple of other, um, thoughts here and a couple of uh, other mental models that can help us understand how people uh, perceive risks and how they perceive and process risks. One is around negative dominance. We know that when people are upset, they put greater value on losses, right? Not surprising. People will be focusing on the negative aspects. Trust determination. When people are upset, they commonly do not trust authority. That does not put scientists in a really, really good position when people are upset. They will, uh, they will be less likely to trust credibility and classic authority. Mental noise. When people are in a stage of high concern, their ability to process information is impaired. Now, I think we've all been there and we all felt that. Uh, what's interesting here that the same model poses that a new illness that fits in a, it fits an infectious disease prototype will be more easily understood. So if we come out during a new pandemic and we say, this is going to be just like the flu, and people will ease into that very, very quickly. And then we say, ah, I know that. I think I know that. I know the risk. It's familiar. I'm, I'm, I'm much more at ease with that. Now, I think one of the biggest communication mistakes that certain public health and uh, authorities and probably politicians made at the beginning is making a lot of people believe that COVID-19 is just like the flu. Uh, because in certain aspects, it's similar, yes. But this mental model, that made people ease into this, uh, this mindset of, okay, maybe it's not that, not too bad because I, I know the flu and it has never killed me. That caused a lot, a lot, a lot, a lots and lots of damage at the beginning of this, uh, of this whole outbreak. So that was definitely a risk communication mistake, uh, that could have been identified, uh, had we had uh, understood the risk better. So we talked about a lot of problems, right? Uh, we talked about people's low level of scientific understanding. Uh, we talked about how even if people have higher levels of scientific understanding, that doesn't really help necessarily. Um, we talked about uh, this issue of, of, of outrage and the myriads of factors that, that go into that. We talked about misinformation. So what really, we as scientists, as, 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 um, as, as people are really doing their groundwork, what, what can we do? Um, and not saying that this is just our responsibility, but are there some tools that we can use and, the, and some frameworks that we can think about as we, um, as we try to assess how to best communicate uh, the risk that, um, uh, that, we're, that we're finding? So 
there are three parts of this part of the presentation. Um, and we want to start with carefully defining the actual hazard that we're talking about. And I'm going to get there in a second what we really mean. It really, really makes a difference whether we talk about a certain aspect uh, of an emergency situation or another aspect of it. So I'll bring an example in a second. The second part is really thinking beyond the scientific meaning of risk, something that we already discussed. Like there's one thing is the scientific understanding of risk, but th there's a whole other world um, outside of that and a whole other host of factors that influence how people perceive risk. And then the third component here is uh, how do we fight misinformation? Can we do that? Oh, like, are there any tools? So this is by no means uh, a complete toolbox, but a couple of considerations that we can take. So let's start with defining the risk well, I would say. And it's not as easy as it sounds. Think about the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. The beginning, we were getting data from China. We were getting data from Northern Italy in terms of what the fatality rate of this disease was, what the hospitalization rate of this disease was, what certain aspects, what, what were the numbers. We uh, we didn't really have reliable or comparable measurements across countries. It was, it was an amorphous uh, monster, this whole package of data. Uh, and it was changing and evolving every single day. So this is not, this is not easy. But um, emerging from that data, there, were, there was a very, very clear direction on, on behalf of public health authorities and certain politicians for this push to talk about fatality rates. And it's understandable. People want to understand if they're at risk of dying. That's the first thing I want to know about this is, am I at risk of dying? Is my grandfather at risk of dying? Is my loved one at risk of dying? So talk about fatality rates absolutely um, like as, a, as a baseline. It's super important. Um, but uh, what that did, partially, is people looked at this number, which again was a moving target. One day it was 1%, the other way it was 1.5%, then it landed around 0.3% fatality. So meaning that less than one in 100 people would die of this disease. Many looked at this risk and might have said that, well, that's not a huge risk, right? And I'm healthy. And I'm probably I probably belong to the um, to the less risky group, and so on and so on. So this number did not really help to raise the right amount of awareness for this risk. On the other hand, what was not really talked about at the beginning was the extreme rate of hospitalization. At that point, uh, in certain in certain states and in certain parts of the world. Uh, hospitalization rates were between 1.1 1 .1 and 10 percent, which means that almost one out of 10 people who got COVID at the, the beginning phase without vaccines, first variant, uh, would get would get to a hospital. And again, there was regional variability uh, um, in in that, but that is a fascinating number that is absolutely not comparable, for instance, to the flu. Right? In the case of the flu, there's one in a thousand people usually who get to a hospital once they get infected. This is almost 100. This is this is this is almost two magnitudes higher uh, that we were measuring at the beginning. However, talking about this risk is more complicated. Uh, it 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 has multiple levels. Uh, it needs multiple levels of thinking. But this was the real. Uh, if if I had to pick between these two, and while fatality is terrible and it's absolutely dramatic, how many people died of COVID. At the same time, what really caused the collapse of healthcare systems was the high hospitalization rate because hospitals got filled and capacities got filled within days and weeks. Um, and those people don't they they didn't they didn't all die, of course. And luckily, all of them survived. But the hospital systems collapsed um, while the hospitals were getting filled up with, with patients. So importantly, uh, thinking about which aspect of the disease were we're focusing on like that really, really defines the course of of our pandemic uh, uh, pandemic reaction and the population's reaction to the pandemic. Focusing on the fatality, which did not seem too high at that point, in my personal opinion was probably off target and probably took us on a uh, on a route where a lot of people did not really feel the true um, the true power of this risk. Now, once we define what risk we're talking about and where our focus is, there's the human component of what we can do, and this toolbox really forces us to think about think about when we communicate about risk. How can we think beyond the scientific understanding, beyond that percentage number, and try to think about who we are talking to? 
Uh, and this is what does not what doesn't come naturally to scientists. And I can speak from my my own experience. It certainly does not come um, naturally to me to uh, to communicate risk to a wide range of um, uh, of populations who 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 are not in my same research field. Um, but we have to understand that there are certain components that if we want our messaging to be effective and if we want the patients to uh, and people to take action uh, on a certain risk, we need to take into consideration. One, knowing our audience. Sounds like a cliche. And for those who, are, who have ever worked in the field of marketing, which are, I guess not many of you, like this, this is something that we hear every day, knowing our audience. If it's very important, um, there's no one general public. And um, when we communicate to the general public, if I hear that nowadays, I cringe because we can't do that. Um, there's not one population we're talking to. There's actually um, a lot of segments and a lot of different groups, uh, um, disadvantaged, more advantaged, lower socioeconomic status, higher socioeconomic status. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, people who we need to tailor our messaging to because their level of scientific understanding and also the things that they care about um, and the channels through which we can talk, talk to them will be completely different. If we want um, to elicit a good behavioral change and, and an effective behavioral action on that risk, we need to think about how we tailor our messages to certain populations. Um, and this really uh, goes hand in hand with building trust with the communities that we're talking to. And you might say that as a scientist, how can I do that? And do I, like, this is really my role? It's not only our role, but we can do a lot. Think about building communities on Twitter, on scientific platforms, on, um, on social media. Nowadays, the scientists are in a different position. If you want to build community, if you want to build trust with the community, there's ways to do that. It's not, it's not easy and it's not straightforward and it's not in the books, but, but there is a way. There's a way to do that because um, gaining trust during an emergency is way harder. We've seen that in the mental models, people actually lose trust during a state of emergency. So if there's not a huge basis of trust, um, we're in, not in a great position. And the second point here, which might come as a surprise to scientists, um, don't shy away from emotions in your delivery of risk. Do talk about emotions. Emotions actually don't take away from the story, they add to it, they empower the story uh, and they make it more powerful. Um, if people see that uh, on the other end of, um, of, of the communication, there's a human being, um, the story will resonate better than if they see that that there's there's a robot-like person who's uh, spitting out data uh, at a very very high speed. Setting expectations is in the middle. What's known? What's uh, what's known? What uh, you know? Who does what? When? What? What do what do people need to know? What's coming up? Uh, what are the next steps in terms of treating the risk that we just identified? When will additional information be provided? Super important. Setting expectations is, uh, is, is absolutely important when, when talking about risk. And a little bit tied to that, acknowledging uncertainty in what, we, um, in what we don't know. There will be a lot of things when we need to get out there and communicate, whether indirectly or directly with, with the audience, uh, that we will not know. And that's normal. And that's, part of the, that's always part of the package. Uh, and acknowledging that uncertainty, rather than saying that this is the complete truth right now, actually builds trust, actually builds, uh, builds a better story, and builds a better story that people resonate with. So acknowledging uncertainty is a plus, it's not a minus, actually. I think there's a lot of misconception around that. Uh, in terms of storytelling, it certainly, certainly helps. And then stating commitment, right? Explaining what public actions are being taken and, and why I have. What is our commitment to the problem? How are we trying to solve the problem right now in the background? So these are just a couple of elements that we really need to think about as we're communicating the risk that we just found out about. And then the last piece of this toolbox is how do we fight misinformation? And can we do that as scientists or as individuals? And isn't it, isn't it a task that is beyond us? Well, certainly it's a huge task and certainly a task that is being very intensively researched. And I don't think we have the golden um, solution and the gold standard for how to deal with misinformation and how to attack it from different angles. But there's a couple of things that, that, that are key considerations that we need to think about and we can think about. One, speed is of the essence. If there's a situation when there's something coming out, there's an emergency coming up, uh, we need to be the first out there with messaging that is 
as correct as possible and as science-based and as based on the fact as, as, as much as possible. Because it exists in, in misinformation research, this concept of, um, of information vacuum and, and misinformation pockets. If there's a lack of information about a topic and the public goes online and starts searching for it and there's no information, that lack of information for sure will, uh, will suck in some sort of information that is not correct. That gap wants to be filled, and that gap will be filled um, in the 21st century with um, uh, with uh, with all the uh, with all the misinformation that is just proliferating online. So we need to we need to find those gaps, Verani, and we need to fill it with great with good information and accurate information. Easier said than done, right? Now, once um, you know, once we're thinking about okay, the misinformation is actually you know spreading, and it's and it's and and you can argue it's spreading actually as a pandemic or as a disease or as an infectious disease. Then there are at least two approaches that we can uh, do there. One, we can take in the approach of post exposure. Once the misinformation is out there, we can debunk it, right? And then the other thing is that before the misinformation gets out, but we have a really good guess of what that information could look, misinformation could look like. If we can predict that, that we can we can do something that's called the inoculation. So let's just spend a minute on on these approaches. First of all, the treatment post exposure uh, to misinformation, which is debunking. How do we do that? There's a very important sequence to debunking misinformation. We can't just go out there and say this is not correct. This is a lie and I know better because I have the data. It doesn't work. We can do that, but it doesn't work. What works is this sandwich approach where we start with the facts. We start with what is known, with what is scientifically correct to our best current understanding. Then we talk about the myth out there, the misinformation out there. And what is the audience exposed to? What's that misinformation? And we only talk about it once. It's key because if we keep repeating, uh, the same misinformation that are that actually our audience is going to get more geared towards that messaging, and there's a risk that we're just hammering in the same messaging a little bit more than uh, than than our own scientifically correct messaging. So, talking about the myth just once, reiterating the misinformation once, and the next step immediately is debunking that and showing where the logical fallacies are and showing what is incorrect in that misinformation and how that misinformation was built on, on wrong facts or it was constructed based on health, uh, well-measured facts, uh, but constructed in a, in a wrong way. And then we close with the facts again. We reiterate the facts and we reiterate the correct information. So this package seems to be effective and there are studies with public health messaging which show that they, these, these show promise, uh, these, um, the, like this mix of approaches. And the last piece here is preventing the misinformation, which is much more in, in a much more theoretical state. Uh, it's much more uh, uh, it's much more theoretical to think about. But vaccination is a good an analogy, actually, funnily enough, for thinking about uh, preventing the misinformation spread. Because what we're really trying to create here is some sort of cognitive immunity for the audience. So when the actual misinformation hits, they're prepared and they say, "Ah, no, no, I heard about this. I I I, I know what they're trying to do here." So how does this work? Well, there's the vaccine part, uh, which is really a forewarning of an impending misinformation, a forecast of, hey, misinformation is coming. Uh, someone's going to say this, and we predict that they're going to say this and that, and it's going to be incorrect. Don't listen to them. That it's a fall fallacy, and um, and and here are the facts instead. So once that is done, then there's a process of of psychological inoculation, which is hypothesized according to this theory, which is where uh, where the, the person generates uh, a cognitive cognitive antibodies. Of course, these cognitive antibodies don't exist, but it's very it's a very good uh, analogy. So then later on, they're immune to that misinformation, and when the actual misinformation hits, they will be more more perceptive to that uh, to 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 sensing the logical fallacies and and the problems with that misinformation. So that is something again more theoretical, but it's it's being tested. In the world of public health and shows great promise so there are a couple of things that we can do and i hope uh, i hope you can see that we're not totally lost and also this is not a complete picture there's much more uh that, that we can talk about that i really wanted to give you a, a high level kind of uh peek into into the toolbox of risk communication and and, and i hope you found it interesting and uh let's keep talking uh, if you have questions or if you want to reach out please do I really thank you for your attention and uh, let's keep in touch.